and being more accustomed. Yeah, it's on top. Okay, hello everybody. Um, my presentation today is about what it's called. It's about making a case for providing and develop, developing readers advisory services. Sorry, there you go, that's what we want. Okay, so rewarding reading training has been happening in New South Wales Public Libraries for over 10 years. Um, the training's happened in each zone and region of New South Wales. So most of us here have either attended one of the train the trainer sessions or should have had ongoing training in their libraries. Now, the definition that we use when we did read that Reader's Advisory training is this one, that Reader's Advisory is a reader-focused service in which knowledgeable, non-judgmental library staff help readers with their leisure reading needs. So that's great, but what I want to talk about is, you know, why we should be doing it. So I want you to imagine that your library is taken over by new management. It might be by people who aren't familiar with standard library practice. They might not ever have worked on the floor in a library. They might never have done a readers advisory transaction. Um, why would they think that this is something that we should be offering for our communities? So how can you show them that there is a return on investment for it? How can you show them that it is actually worthwhile for them to spend the time and resources on providing the service to our communities? Some questions that I would suggest that we should be able to ask ourselves and to answer are exactly that. So why invest resources into this in the first place? What does a good reader's advisory service look like? And how do we know if we're doing a good job? In 2014, we did, uh, the State Library did a statewide survey on the state of Reader's Advisory Services. We asked a lot of different questions, but a few things came back that we thought were really interesting. One of them was, we asked people how effective they think their Reader's Advisory Service is. We can see from looking at the slide that it's about a 50-50 split. So, you know, half of us think we're doing a pretty good job and half of us don't feel that we're doing a good job at all. The other stat that I thought was really interesting is we asked people about what they measure. And again, the stat showed that about half of the people are measuring some of their readers' advisory services, but actually about half of us are not measuring anything at all. Um, this is what we want to say. So if we want to be taken seriously as a profession, we actually need to behave professionally. We need to be able to demonstrate to people that we, that we are doing a good job and that readers' advisory matters. We have a lot of data that shows us what people borrow, but we don't really have data that shows us why people borrow it. So if we look at this slide, 76% of loans are from fiction collections. This is just print loans, but it includes adult and junior collections, and about a quarter of it is non-fiction. Now, we would know that some of that non-fiction would be for recreational reading, and it may well be the case that some of the fiction is for informational reading. But, you know, but we don't know that because we actually don't ask anybody. Um, but again, I think if we look at that standard, we know that a very large majority of our community who are coming into the library to borrow are borrowing recreational material and has implications for how we provide the service. So when I talk about the importance of measuring data, we need to be thinking about why we're doing it. It's not just having numbers just for the sake of it. So I think that there's a few benefits that it can provide us. Um, it will help us to understand our customer needs and to identify areas for improvement. It'll help us to monitor the development of the service over time. It'll help us to measure our service against other library services. It'll show us the ways that Reader's Advisory meets the objectives of our organisation. It'll show the return on investment for providing the service. It'll advocate for us. And it'll also show the need for expert staff. Um, one of the things that we like to talk a lot about is the value of reading. And I think that you know, I imagine that most of the people here today are readers and we can talk about our personal experience of reading and how that's really important to us. But what we need to remember is a lot of the people that might be advocating on our behalf or making decisions about how resources are spent may not be readers and they may not think that reading is particularly important. They may not think that reading is something that public libraries need to spend money encouraging their communities to do. So I've gone through and done some reading and I just wanted to show you on the screen we've got some of the 
the things that reading can do besides just being entertaining. So it's proven to increase empathy, to improve people's interpersonal relationships. It can reduce symptoms of depression. It can reduce the risk of dementia. It can improve wellbeing throughout life and it can reduce stress. So these are all really important things that reading can offer to the community. Now, I've also found that somebody who does reading advisory activities like attending book clubs, it significantly reduces your risk of death. So I think that when we're doing book club and things like that, and sometimes we feel a bit frustrated by that, I think it's important to remember we are in fact saving lives. <laughs> so if we understand that reading can do all of those things for us, I think the big question for us to ask is how does Reader's Advisory have implication on that? So we can acknowledge reading is great, but I think the big question for us to be asking is can we prove that actually doing a Reader's Advisory service in the library makes any contribution towards that? Now, I don't have all of the answers to that really. I'm just wanting to start a conversation about that. But I think it's really important to think about. Now, one of the things that I would like is just a little bit of a show of hands. Who here knows how Reader's Advisory aligns with their council's strategic goals? Can anybody put up their hands? If someone asked them that, could they answer that question? Okay, so one. Um, what I would put to you about that is that if the people who are paying you to do your job want to come and talk to you about what you're doing and why you're doing it, it's really quite important that you can talk to them about how it meets the needs of the organisation. So I really encourage you to look through those plans and those documents and think about how the work you do aligns towards it. Because if you can't demonstrate that what you do matters in the context of your company or organisation's goals, then chances are that the resources will be diverted into something that can prove that it is meeting those goals. So let's talk a little bit about what should be measured and how we can measure it. Now, I know that talking about collecting data is a little dry. What I've done is I've made a document and I've popped it up on the Reader's Advisory Wiki, so I'm not going to go through it in really close detail, but it's there for everybody to have a look at. And again, the Wiki, like everything, is meant to be a working document that we all contribute to. So if there's anything that I've missed or anything that could be improved on, I would love it if people would get back to us because we want this to be a great resource that we all can use. <laughs> Okay, so for the purpose of it, I've divided Reader's Advisory up into a few different sort of categories. So I've done self-directed RA, um, reading orientated programs, digital RA, staff training and customer interactions. So self-directed RA are the things that our customers can come into the library and use without necessarily having to interact with staff. So that's our things like displays and book lists and shelf talkers, all those sorts of things. Now, I, in my opinion, the objectives of doing those sorts of things are to promote our programs and services, to identify titles by genre, to make it easy for people to find what they want, um, signage, promoting reader likes and drawing attention to the collection. So there's different things, of course, that we can measure with that, but I've just got an example here from Ride Library. So Ride Library have got a fast read collection and I know a lot of libraries have got the quick high turnover short line collections. Now what we can see looking at this is Ride Library's collection has an average of 16.6 loans a year compared to the rest of their collection, which has 4.9. So I think that they can make a strong case that that's money really well spent and those are books are being well used by their, their customers. Um, when we talk about reading oriented programs, we're talking about things like reading discussion groups, author talks, programs and events, all those sorts of things. Now, again, this is one that I think should people should be able to make a strong case for with their strategic plans because providing that opportunity for social interaction, I think, is really something we can make a case for that really aligns to wellbeing and so on. Okay. Now, Mossman Library does um, a program called Read, Review and Win that's directed towards adult readers. So they do it twice a year in July and January, and usually they get up to 40 participants. So it's really just a program where they're encouraging people to put a review on the library website. So it's adding value to the library website and people win a prize for doing it. So, you know, that's a great thing to do. Um, Stanton Library, I think we all know, probably has one of New South Wales' strongest and most interesting program of author events. Last year they did 61 events and they had 4,378 attendees. That's an amazing number and not all of our libraries are able to run programs on that kind of scale. But, you know, we do our best. So last year at the library that I work at at Hornsby, we did 21 programs and we had 1,327 people. Now, 
we're happy with that stat and we project that our number is going to be bigger again this year. But it also improved on the year before. So we are making an effort to demonstrate that we're growing our service over time. Our average attendance at events is also increasing. So we think that by collecting this data, we're showing that we're improving and that it's a service that's valued by our community. And we make a real effort to show that it aligns to our goals of building community relationships. We do catering afterwards and really make an effort to give people the opportunity to have a social interaction interaction, that's a really important part of our program. Um, digitally based RA are all the things that we do on our websites and online. Um, and we want people to think of the website as being a trusted source of reading suggestions. Um, Canada Bay, in their e-newsletter, we can see that the most clicked article in the newsletter that they sent out was an RA-based one. It was on a book review. So again, that demonstrates that people are interested in it. Um, I went through and I got um, from the State Library stats about novelist search results. Now, I found it really tricky to put it into a diagram because Sutherland has half a million, which is lots more than anybody else. And so I couldn't include them in any of the graphs because it made everybody else invisible. <laughs> now, what I found though is really the difference between the kind of the pink ones, which are the biggest numbers and the white ones. Um, uh, Sutherland and Mullara and Riverina have novelists integrated into their catalogue, so it makes a huge difference. Um, I don't know of anybody from Sutherland here today, but I was chatting to Martin Boyce and he was saying, of course, one of the reasons it's so high is because it's integrated. Whenever somebody does a catalogue search, it shows up as a novelist result. But the fact that it's integrated means that people don't need to enter a library card number or anything like that to have access to the novelist material and that it's really, really easy for staff to use it on the desk so that it's really genuinely well utilised there. But even, you know, getting down again, like these are the top 10 libraries, but, you know, Mossman's so in between July and February, it was 509. That's still a good number of searches every week. So it is being used. But again, I think it's worth examining why it's bigger in some libraries than others and what you can do to make it more prominent and more useful for people. Um, another thing, of course, that's always worthwhile collecting is customer anecdotes and things like that. Now, this is from Warringah Council Library does a service that we call Your Librarian, which is a form-based RA program, and Jules is going to get up and talk to us a bit about that later. But some of her feedback is lovely. You know, people are happy with the suggestions, they love everything that the library does, they're going to share it with their friends. That kind of customer feedback is so valuable for us to be able to share with our stakeholders. Staff training, again, is something that I think we all acknowledge is really important. As we said, the State Library funds the rewarding reading program and then it's our responsibility to make sure we're keeping that up to date within our libraries. Um, I think that we all know that the difference between having professional staff who are well trained and experienced in doing readers advisory makes a really big impact. But again, we want to evaluate and measure to show that it's worthwhile to invest time in training your staff. This is some staff feedback from a training session that I did out at the Hawkesbury Library. What was really interesting to me is all of this feedback is from people saying how useful they found it, seeing examples of what's happening in other libraries. And it made me real. You, not all library staff spend their time looking at other libraries' websites and social media feeds and going and visiting other libraries. So they don't necessarily know what's going on out in the world and they don't necessarily know what best practice is. So I think that it can be a really important part of training to find ways to share those ideas with people. And just as a little segue, on the um, Flickr, the, Ref the New South Wales reference Flickr account, we've been putting up lots and lots of pictures of different RA activities and programs people are doing in their libraries. So I really encourage you to have a look, but also to send us your own photos and program ideas because, you know, we all love to see what's going on at each other's libraries. So customer interactions. Now, this was meant to be the crux of my talk that I was going to do to you today. So at Hornsby, when we did the last set of ECR stats, I actually included some extra questions. We wanted to break down the difference between author title information questions and author title readings advisory questions and so on to see how it's going. Now, 
sometimes the results you get back from a survey are not what you expected. What I got back from this survey is that there's a real opportunity to do some training with our staff because not very many people were marking down that they'd done any Redis advisory interactions at all, even though our stats about branch transfers, for instance, showed that very, very many works of fiction were transferred amongst the branches that week. It actually didn't show up on our survey. So we have um, library-wide staff training coming up very soon and that's going to be something that we'll be able to talk about and I hope that then when we do the next set of survey results we get a different picture. Now the reason I wanted to do that was based on this slide here. So this is a library in the States called Snow Isle. We can see the big blue slide and the big orange slide that's all their readers advisory questions. So again, about you know three quarters of their questions they're being asked by their customers is RA based. And I would assume that in the majority of our libraries, considering that the majority of our loans are based on leisure reading collections, that our, our stats would be similar. So I'm gonna be really interested to see what happens the next time we measure at Hornsby. And again, I would really encourage any of you here to measure that as well and to share that data. It would be really interesting to know. So we're talking about collecting data and I know it takes time. So I wanna talk about how you can use it and why bother. Um, I think you can use it to advocate for Reader's Advisory. Um, and I would really encourage being careful about using the word Reader's Advisory when we talk about it because you, most people don't know what you're talking about. Um, and so to think about other ways to phrase it, even if you just use the word customer service, which really is what Reader's Advisory is, it's probably something that will have more resonance and meaning to the average person. Um, it, you can use it as a, to build a case to develop new projects. As I was talking to my manager yesterday and I said to her, you know, if I come to you and say I would like to do a one book, one community project, I think it looks awesome. What would my answer probably be? You know, no, but if I come to her with stats to show that other libraries have done it well and they've had good take up and it's had good impact, well, that would be the thing that would make her take me seriously. And that's it. Again, it's because we're acting professionally and showing that we've done our research and thought about it before we approach. Um, you can use it when you're applying for jobs. You know, we know that that can be a challenging thing to have to show that we meet the criteria in a job. If you can actually provide data to show that a project that you've worked on or implemented has been successful, that's going to give you a much stronger response. Same for performance review and also giving people the opportunity to create good news stories about the library to share. Um, as I say, when you're sharing your data, target the evidence to the audience. Think about what's useful to them to know and use language that's useful to them. Now, an example of that that I want to give you is last year, Warringah Council won the Blewett Award, and that was very important to them. It was a big deal, and they put a lot of work into the application. Now, for the section about the library, a really big part of that was talking about the Your Librarian service. So that was a service that spoke to people in senior management of the library. They understood what it was. They understood that it was a value-added customer service, and they thought that that was a story worth sharing. So when you go back to work, these are the things that I would like you to think about doing. First and foremost, look at your strategic plan and really think about how it aligns to the work you're doing. Find out what data's already been collected. Talk to people, ask them what they've got. With novelists, for instance, somebody in your library has novelist data, ask them about it. Um, think about what else could be useful and whether or not you're able to collect it. And then share that data. Think about ways that you can share that data that will be a good news story and make them feel like Reader's Advisory is something we're talking about. And that's it. Um, so thank you. Has anybody got any questions or anything like that? Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question about how you're saying that um, Reader's Advisory is actually like customer service. Honestly, I didn't think of it like that before. But also, um, when somebody comes in and asks you for a specific title, you're not really helping them in terms of suggesting, you're just using your research skills to find out where it is. Sure, but Reader's Advisory doesn't only have to be an in-depth suggestion interaction. So actually somebody asking you to help them find a book is, I mean, it might be easy Reader's Advisory, but it still is. And so I do, no, well, you know, look, I tend to think of it as any value that we add to making the leisure reading collections discoverable. So somebody asking you to help them find a book yeah. is Reader's Advisory. It might develop into something more, but no, for sure it is. So I think the stats wrong on that one. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
that's okay, I forgive you. <laughs> That, that's exactly right. It is often the case that when somebody approaches us to ask for a particular title, we may not have it available at that time. And of course, it is a really great opportunity to segue into something else. There's stats that come from opening the book um, in the UK that show that when people come in browsing for leisure reading, it's a 50-50 split. Half of the people know what they want and just want to go and pick it up from the shelf. And half of the people are just coming in to browse. But for the people that do know what they want, Again, it's a 50-50 split. Half of the time it's not going to be on the shelf. So, in fact, 75% of our people are browsers rather than people searching directly for what they want. And I think that's a really important thing to think about when we're doing Reader's Advisory. What things are we putting in place to facilitate browsing of the library and to make the collection discoverable? That's I, I mean, I certainly think that um, self-directed Reader's Advisory is very, very important. And in some ways, we are perhaps adding more value with that than we are by our direct interactions with people. Any other questions? Um, we are looking at rejigging our whole RA at Library. And yes. we've been asked to put a proposal together. Mm -hmm. And we've asked to look at best practices within RA. Sure. Can you suggest any resources, <coughs> insights, that it's something that we're working on with the um, with the RA working group. We're actually looking at setting up a refex module, which is a training module that will make recommendations about training and things like that. But just getting a suggestion. No, no, I was just going to comment on this. Yeah. Um, Minnesota years ago did yeah. a really good listing. They're still kind of like the best ones around. It looks old and daggy on the website, if it's still there but they actually had very detailed information on what, what good practice looks like. You've got to decide whether you want that degree of good practice, um, but they actually did have very, very good information around it. Um, because we're being encouraged to turn, to look away from print and go more digital in terms of uh, a yeah, I think that's an area a lot of people are struggling with. It's definitely something to raise through, I think, for some of the working group discussions. I also like the way Joyce was mentioning today across formats that it's not just, you know, she didn't just do books. It was like, <laughs> oh, by the way, there's audio and, you know, that's actually the best way to listen to this book or there's video or whatever. So I think you've actually got to look quite broadly at it. Um, but I think it's definitely, it's something that keeps getting raised in the Reader's Advisory um, meetings, but it is being worked at, but it's a work in very early progress at this stage, so you actually might want to contribute to help write the wiki. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And again, look, I think I guess that I would say is if we think about RA the way we think of reference, like if somebody comes up to you and says that they would like a travel guide to Paris, we don't say, mm, you know, I'm not really that interested in Paris. Like I've been to China. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you want, I could show you some travel guides about China, but I don't like Paris at all. Like we. I certainly hope that nobody would even dream of doing that. And so even though I might not know anything about Paris, you know, I might not know what country Paris is in, I don't know, I would then look up the catalogue or look up some other resources and find that information for them. And actually my personal opinion about Paris is completely irrelevant to that transaction. And it's exactly the same thing with Reader's Advisory. Um, it doesn't matter if you like what that person likes. It doesn't matter if you read their genre or not. We're professionals and it's our job to use the tools at our fingertips to look that thing up. And in fact, even if they're asking about a genre that you like, I think, of course, it's fine. You know, not robots. It's fine to let the person know that and to talk about, you know, mention that a book was a particular favourite of yours. They're not there to get your personal list of favourite books. They're there to get things that they would like to read. So... 
you know, I sometimes think when people say they can't do readers advisory because they don't read or that they, you know, they can't do RA for, like, I, I don't read mysteries. Um, so I can't do readers advisory off the top of my head, but should I necessarily always be doing it off the top of my head anyway? Because it's not about what I've remembered, it's about me helping the patron find the best result for them. Okay. Now, for the next presentation, oh, have we got one more question? Sorry. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Now, for the next presentation, it, we are supposed to be having Eric Dodson from Lane Cove Library. Now, he unfortunately is sick today, so I'm going to step in and mine are. Um, so I hope I do his slides justice. Microphone. Okay, the reason that we decided to do this presentation on keeping up with what's hot is because in the feedback all the time, it's one of the things that people always say they struggle with is how to keep up to date with new titles. So we've gone through and just made some suggestions about resources we think are useful. Well, when I say we, I mean Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we're just getting ready to swap those slides over. Thank you. Okay, the first thing, surprisingly, that I'm going to direct you to is to the wiki. Now, the wiki is the thing that the Readers Advisory Working Group we put a lot of our time and effort into keeping that maintained and up to date. So it's a really good first port of call. Again, like I said in the last presentation, if you've got an idea for something that we don't have on there, by all means send it to us. It's a group project. Um, a website that is really worthwhile subscribing to is Early Word. They send out all manner of things. It's an American site, but you know, generally speaking, that's relevant to us. So they send out alerts about books that are selling well, about what's hot. So it's a really good thing. And again, there's a newsletter that you can subscribe to for that. Um, and other newsletters worth subscribing to, Love Reading UK is a good one. The bookshop things, all that sort of, because I always think that if you see a book coming up over and over again in the bookstore catalogues and things like that, that lets us know that it is a title that the publisher is investing money in. If we've seen it a lot, probably our community members have seen it a lot. So it's worthwhile for us to be aware of it. And you don't need to read the books to be able to do readers advisory for them. And if we know we've seen the Nancy Pearl talk about reading a book in five minutes or 10 minutes, just looking at the cover and reading the blurb really gives us a lot of information about it. And just being familiar with the sorts of books that are being well promoted is really a good way to be desk ready to go out and do some RA. Um, the Book House is also one that's worth subscribing to. Good Reading Magazine, which I imagine every library in New South Wales has a subscription to, is of course very useful. And then there's the back issues as well on the shelf that you can browse through. When I worked at Moringa, something that we used to do was creating a list of what we called five-star stories, where things that were given five-star reviews in publications like Goodreads, we actually tagged in the catalogue, and there was a link to that, so that if somebody came in and they were just looking for a great book and you were struggling to find something on the shelf, that was a fantastic resource to go to. Um, novelists, of course, we all have access to. Their newsletters and blogs are a fantastic resource. If you're not subscribed to those, I would really recommend it. Goodreads is the biggest social media website for readers. Once a year, they do a selection of books that are voted on by the public. 
it's a fantastic place to look because it's voted on by the readers and it's across a wide range of genres. So you don't only have literary fiction the way that you tend to if you look at most awards lists. These are the things that the readers are voting for. And again, you can go back and look at it. It's archived, so it's not doesn't just have to be things from this year because a book that was the best book in 2013 is likely to still be quite a good book in 2015, but it's also likely to be on the shelf. And again, we're coming back to looking at the wiki. Now, something else that we talked about was the idea about using Twitter to keep up to date with things. Again, can I have a show? How many people here have a smartphone? Okay, how many people here use Twitter? Okay, so the thing about Twitter is that you don't have to send tweets to use Twitter. And that what you could do if you are interested in keeping up with current news about books and publishing is just subscribe to those types of links. Um, you can scroll through and probably read a day's worth of posts, you know, on the commute to work, in your morning tea break, something like that. It's a really, really quick and easy way of keeping up to date with the chatter that's going on out in the book world. Um, it means you can stay up to date with, you know, the awards list that was just announced or you can see what the publishers are promoting. So I would really advocate for using that as a really quick and easy way to keep up to date. If you already have a smartphone, it's free to use. It doesn't take long to set up an account. Like I say, you don't have to put any effort into it. So I would really suggest that that's another great way to keep up to date. Now, has anybody got any resources that they would suggest that we haven't talked about today? Is there something somebody finds to be their most valuable way of keeping up with what's what? I've got to admit, shameless Becky Stratford fan, but her um, RA for All blog um, site is really good. Yeah. It's a lot of readers' advisory stuff. She does great reviews. She also has a parallel horror blog, um, so that very easy to get up with both techniques but also um, resources. Yeah, so just for the microphone, if anyone didn't hear, Becky Spratford, who did a fantastic talk for us a few years ago, does have a blog. It's called RA for All. And I would really recommend that everybody has a look at it. One, something that Becky does that I really admire is that she puts up slides from presentations that she's done. So even if you are not able to go to the States and see her things in person, actually there's a lot of fantastic resources on her website. Um, another thing that I might mention that Eric didn't have in his slide is webinars and training. There is a lot of free webinars and training coming out of the States. Um, you don't need to watch it while you're at work. You don't need to get up and watch it at three o'clock in the morning. A lot of it is played on YouTube and things like that. Again, on the wiki, we've got links to a lot of those sessions. It's really a fantastic way to, um, to digest some of the RA concepts that are out there. And I would really recommend that to anybody. <laughs> I was just gonna say there's a lot of Facebook groups for different genres and what people who are beginning out with the genres are reading yeah absolutely right so again like facebook groups and any kind of online discussion around the genre is a good way to see what people are talking about um Jack Wright has a weekly um, podcast that you can keep people who are commuting along about podcasts it covers a few as well as Okay, so that, yeah, so that's like you're saying a podcast, which you're getting you right. Like a lot of people do like to listen to their news rather than to read it, and there are a lot of fantastic podcasts out there. I'm just fantastic fiction. Like a lot of people come in and they want their favourite author, but they want to know what's coming out. They sometimes lose to what's coming out for the next year, even though it doesn't cover art. That's that's, that's right. Again, fantastic fiction is great for seeing what's coming out by an author, and actually. I personally find it to be probably the best resource for working out series and for, um, for alternate titles. I mean, it's not a pretty website, but it's certainly functional. Has anybody got anything else? Um, Empire, like for movies um, yes. and reviews, do a really great um, podcast series as well. Okay. Now, when Eric was meant to be the person presenting, I was going to be the person taking notes of any suggestions that anybody made. So. I've not been able to do that. I'd really encourage you all to email any audience comments or anything like that, because then we can add them onto the wiki so that everybody can have access to them. Or, or you can add them yourself. So if you don't already have permission to be a writer, you can apply to get access to be a writer to the wiki and actually you doing it yourself makes our lives much easier. Yes. Some of it you can do 
Sure. So the question is really about how much of our own personal time we should be investing. Look, I just say that's up to you as an individual, but um, certainly I do. I put a lot of my personal time into keeping up with it because I, you know, I take my job seriously and that's what I do. I certainly don't expect that anybody at work is going to pay me to be reading updates on Twitter or anything like that. So I do do it in my own time. I, I don't, sorry? Well, again, I think it's hard for me to say time and trends um, because it's up to the individual. For me, if I was only going to do one thing, I would subscribe to Twitter and just check it for 10 minutes every morning and I think that that would probably be a good indication. Um, that would just give me that really brief overview. If I really wanted to have in-depth information and to be doing webinars and things like that, it's a lot more time and it is just up to the individual. Sorry. <laughs> That's, that's absolutely right. And again, I guess I would say to that, you know, readers advisory and reading is my personal area of interest. So it doesn't always really seem like work to be reading those sorts of things. Yes. I just wanted to um, get a, sort of a picture of how many people here are finding themselves having to do RA services for children as well, or like they're, they're integrated services. And so, you know, the resources that people find it's confusing for well, we're talking about children's stuff this afternoon, so that'll be covered then. But what my answer to that would be is that really, again, Reader's Advisory is basically the same no matter what age group the person is. Again, it's just about using the tools at our disposal to help them find a book or, you know, reading material that will suit their needs. Um, now, we're out of time, so I should hand over for the next speaker. Now, that is lovely Helen from Windsor Caribbean. She is going to be running our um, 10 slides in five minute sessions, which are always my highlight of the session. So thank you very much, Helen. Yeah. Thanks, Melanie. That, I think that was really great. You did a wonderful job being Eric. Thanks. In smaller <laughs> shoes. And not as, and not as no, not as Eric. Yeah. <laughs> oh, come on. Right. Um, look, every year we send out the call uh, who's got five minutes, who's got ten slides, who'd like to tell us about what great things you're doing in your library. And I have to say this year, I, I feel like I've had the easiest part of, of getting this all together because you guys were just amazingly efficient, quick responses, lovely, lovely things. So while we just get this up, our first one is Sharon from Hornsby and she's going to talk us about our rapid read. So I'm really excited about seeing this too. So come on up, Sharon. Okay. Hi all and I hope you can hear me up the back. Can you all hear me up the back? Yes. Wave. I need more waving. And while we're waving, why don't we do a Mexican wave starting on this side? <laughs> Come on, we've been sitting for a while, so let's work it across. And I hope this is filmed. Okay. <laughs> so, great to hear the laughs. Okay, bear with me. I'm actually very, very nervous. This is my first time I've actually done a presentation here at the State Library. So, please be patient and send me lots of love. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, my name's Sharon and I'm the Customer Services Coordinator at Hornsby Library. And I'm here today to talk about my baby, so which I'm very proud of because I basically oversaw the implementation, planning and implementation of our Rapid Reads collection at Hornsby and the other four branches. Oh, so just... Where am I? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Right, well our Rapid Reads collection, it was launched in May 2015 during Library and Information Week at Hornsby Central Library and we had our Mayor and Local MP cutting the ribbon. Now we've got five branches, Hornsby Central, we've got Pennant Hills, Epping, Brower and Galston. So the collection was launched across all five libraries. Okay, so what is the Rapid Reads collection at Hornsby Library and Information Service? 
It's high demand titles. It's a shorter loan period, 10 days, as opposed to our regular borrowing period of 28 days for adult fiction. We have a higher overdue fine of $1 per day, as opposed to 20 cents per day. Uh, you can't reserve any titles in the Rapid Reads collection, and there are no renewals as well. Now, it's basically a reward for the walk-in customer, as we do not show these titles that we have in the Rapid Reads collection in our catalogue. And when we launched, because the collection was obviously smaller at the time of launch, we only had two titles per customer, which we have subsequently increased to four, four titles per customer. Okay, now how we did it, there was a lot of prep work involved. So we spent about six months doing research and presentation and we investigated and contacted our colleagues in other libraries about how they were doing their collections if, if they, they had them. So we call it rapid reads, some other libraries call it fast reads. So, you know, there's a variation in names, but I think the, the theme is the same. Now, the main points for consideration when we are planning for our launch of our collection, well, what's important to all of us is budget, authors, fiction or non-fiction, the format, hardback, trade paperback. And we were very lucky that we actually had a launch budget of $10,000 to start with. So we decided to launch with fiction titles. And as we were launching in May, we obviously needed a substantial number of authors and titles to display, as you can see. We couldn't have just, you know, five titles and, you know, a handful of books because we wanted to go big with a bang. So as we wanted the latest titles to be available for around the launch period in May. So with Rapid Reads, it depends on what authors are publishing their titles at the time as well. So what we did was we went back three months for authors who had just published titles so that we would have a substantial number of um, books on the shelf. Okay. And as you can see, we, we've had, it's quite, we had quite a very uh, large range of titles. And what we also did behind every book, as we got our books supplied through James Bennett, we paid for them to do a copy of the cover. So after launch, as books were being borrowed, we didn't want the shelf looking empty. So we actually had covers of our titles so that people, the, the customers would know, oh, but this title's out now, but we know it's available. So hopefully, you know, they would come back another day and hopefully the title would be back on the shelf. So we ended up with 38 authors and their titles at the time of launch in May. How we, we basically chose our authors from our standing order, our adult fiction standing order list, and we created a separate rapid read standing order list as well. So that after the initial launch, as an author, author's new books are published, we automatically receive a copy for rapid reads. But I also might mention we're not restricted by our rapid read standing order list so that if there's a sleeper that suddenly comes onto the bestseller list we'll actually make it onto the rapid reads list so that harper lee when you know that was an unexpected publication last year published go set a watchman we purchased copies and we added them to them so this would apply to any novel that suddenly storms the bestseller list so that you know we're constantly scanning you know the top 10 that might be in the sydney morning herald spectrum have we, have we missed anything? There's a sleeper novel that's just suddenly appeared out of nowhere. Uh, one point to note, even though books such as The Luminaries last year, which won a major prize, might be considered for rapid reads, we decided not to add it because due to the large size, due to the limited number of days that you can actually borrow the item, a, a customer might not be able to read such a large tome in 10 days. So our rapid reads, the decision was made, we're concentrating on trade paperbacks because we're buying multiple copies. And obviously it's been cheaper, if they get damaged, you know, wear and tear, it doesn't matter that they're being deleted. Now, also we did rapid read stickers for each book. And as you can see on these novels, this, this is what it is. Um, they were created by our in-house graphic designers in council in our corporate colors. So it's basically taking after the Women's Weekly Goodreads. So it's at a glance, um, one of the good things about these stickers too, they're removable. So as a, as a title finishes its time in our Rapid Reads collection, which we're deeming say two to three months, um, the stickers removal and the titles go back into our general fiction collection. So we get you know quite a lot of usage for the, for the money we're spending. 
Okay, and as you can see on our stickers, it actually highlights the loan conditions as well. And um, it's working quite well because it's recognisable. And we also had bookmarks made for the time of launch and each book had a, had a bookmark inserted with the, with the conditions of loan and to signify that it was a rapid read title. Okay, um, one other thing we did when we were planning for the launch, we had to consider how many copies of each title were we planning. Now we had five libraries, we wanted a, a sufficient number of, of books, you know, for each branch to launch with. So James Patterson, one of the most prolific fiction authors you have around, we actually ordered 15 copies for the five libraries in a ratio of five, five for Hornsby, four for Penitils, four for Epping, and one for Galston Barrera, being our smaller branches. And also, so as well as the stickers, the bookmarks, the flyers, we had posters created and sent to all branches and signage saying coming soon, coming soon in preparation for the launch. Okay. Now, other considerations that one has to consider is what happens when new titles are released by authors? Because obviously you've only got so much finite space, you can't keep growing the collection to display. So using James Patterson as an example again, he, he co-writes with quite a lot of different authors. He can be publishing, you know, two titles a month. So we changed, as soon as he's got a new title released, we withdraw it from the Rapid Reads collection. We change the status on the catalogue so it shows again, take off the sticker and it's absorbed back into the general collection. Okay, and also what we did to accommodate all these X rapid read titles being absorbed back into the general collection, we actually had to reduce our adult fiction standing order list so that we wouldn't end up with 20, 25 copies across five libraries. Now, after about five months, we actually sat down, myself and the branch managers. Oh, okay, I'm gonna speed this up. <laughs> Okay, we sat down, we basically did a feedback session. How are we going? Okay, reviewed the rapid collection, uh, the reads collection, adjusted authors. We removed some, some that had died in the meantime. We thought, well, they're not going to publish anymore, although they might, you know, have some in their estates. But obviously, we reviewed the loan rates, which are absolutely wonderful. And as Melanie alluded to, I think when she mentioned in her speech earlier, right, have a fast reads collection as well. So our our statistics are on par with Ride. And um, we've had a lot of positive feedback from our customers. They love it. I'll just show you some displays that we have um, at our libraries. Here is Pennant Hills. And they're usually all located up the front of the library. So we've got Pennant Hills. Here's Epping Library, the pyramid display. So they're all situated at the front. Customer usually runs in. We have our regular Rapid Reads customers. They'll return their titles and they'll quickly grab the next lot and they love it. Here we have Barrera Library, which is one of our smaller libraries. Uh, apologies to Galston, I wasn't able to get a photo in time for Galston. But I'd like to leave you with this and thank you very much for listening to me talk about Rapid Reads and if anyone wants to talk to me or contact me after today, I'm very happy to discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Okay, our next presenter is uh, Renee Fitler from Ashfield. Uh, she's talking about RA sessions for uh, her library customers. I will wait for one minute at you. Okay. Look at me. I'm sitting there like, <laughs> <laughs> Just a moment. experiment with something to see if it works. It works. <laughs> Sorry. Well, thank you, Sharon. Um, very tough act to follow and very inspiring. Um, my name is Renee Fittler. I've been at Ashfield Library for almost four years. And I'm going to speak about our RA sessions for our patrons um, and a whole lot more. You can tell what my favourite movie is um, by the title. Reader's Advisory actually is all around at Ashfield Library. It's there from the moment you walk in and it even follows you home. 
So what is actually happening in Reader's Advisory at Ashfield? We have an electronic notice board in the foyer. We participate in Read, Watch, Play. We have genre bookmarks, which I'll focus quite heavily on. We do the Reader's Advisory sessions before our author talks. And we train our staff following on from rewarding reading. Uh, we have staff RA training sessions, which happened last year. When you walk into Ashfield Library, uh, you'll notice the electronic notice board, um, which revolves around a whole lot of slides. Um, so you might see Renee is reading, and I can recommend or suggest all of these books. Uh, you might also see what our youngest members are reading and um, what's new in our collection. A recent slide was for February's Read, Watch, Play theme, which was Speed Read. And there are a whole variety of titles that were featured from junior fiction up in the top right uh, to nonfiction, short stories, um, all kinds of fast reads. And that's updated every month. And um, I've been actively participating in Read, Watch, Play tweeting each month. Um, I've noticed that we've gained followers each time that we've um, tweeted in those sessions. Uh, I also um, post on Facebook about Read, Watch, Play and include um, book suggestions. Uh, we also um, do displays, book displays, when you first come into the library, um, featuring each month's theme, and those pretty much walk out the door. Now, genre bookmarks. Um, this is my baby, this is my, my project, and I have some available for you to take away if you'd like to come and see me afterwards. Um, so last year, um, I, I pitched to my manager that we should, um, we should roll out some genre bookmarks to go along with our genre rooms at Ashfield Library. And so we found money within our budget and worked with a local um, design firm called Sweets Workshop. Uh, we put together lists of um, about 40 authors per, um, per bookmark, and then they put together the graphics. Um, so within our first um, rollout, our first series, there was romance, uh, young adult fiction, crime and thriller, the hard-boiled type, um, Australian, which was quite popular. There was also a read-on bookmark, which wasn't as popular. We also had a fantasy bookmark. Uh, I don't think science fiction is on there. Um, those weren't very popular. I think a lot of the um, a lot of patrons were more self serve, and they they look online for their reading suggestions. Um, so that it's it's been a bit experimental as to what has worked and what hasn't. Um, junior fiction was very popular, um, as was. <clears throat> cozy crime. Now, these bookmarks um, were so successful that um, we received approval to come out with series two. So in series two, we had in translation, uh, picture books um, and Asian writers. Also classics. Um, there's Australian again, which was reprinted. Um, My City of Sydney was a very popular one in which um, authors who, who write about Sydney um, featured on here. Uh, there's also a GLBTQI bookmark. Um, and there's a series three coming up. Uh, we're going to have the best of the award winners. Uh, we'll have Harry Potter Readalikes, uh, Popular Science and Technology, and Chick Lit, to name a few. And um, these bookmarks are also on our website. There's a book suggestion part of our website. Um, so any of the authors who didn't make the cut um, are on our website in addition to all of the ones that are on our bookmarks. Now to complement the rollout of these bookmarks, um, a colleague and I have been having um, talks before our author talks. There are reader's advisory presentations. Um, they happen about four to six times a year. I gave one this past Friday before an author talk about our classics collection. And I didn't tell everyone what they should read, um, but I spoke about classics more broadly. I spoke about um, 
how one shouldn't feel guilty about having not read every single classic, um, and also um, what you can bring to reading the classics later in life, if there are some that you have missed. Now, I mentioned our, our website. Uh, there is the book suggestion part of our website. And I list a few helpful websites. So these are for our borrowers, um, but also for um, my colleagues who are asked um, readers advisor type questions when they're on the information desk. And some of them are voracious readers, others might not be. And so they can quickly go to the book suggestion part of our website, um, go to a few of these websites listed, go to the different genres um, that are featured on the bookmark, suggest a few authors. Um, they, I did, a, I did some training of my um, colleagues uh, where we went through each website. Uh, we also um, read a book in five minutes, which is something I learned at Rewarding Reading. We got to play with the collection, look at the cover, read the first page, read the last page, read the blurb, um, get a feel for a book. So I've encouraged um, my colleagues to, to play around with our collection, to just stop and um, have a little bit of a read. It is, it is allowed. Um, so I think my time is up. Um, so this shows how Reader's Advisory actually is all around at Ashfield Library and at Haverfield, the branch where I'm based. Uh, so if you'd like to see, um, pick up any bookmarks from me, you can come and see me afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, Renee. Great. Now, our next presenter, Julianne Kearney from Warringah, and she's Woo! talking about your librarian service. <laughs> I can leave you. Oh, we'll show you. I'll just give that a little bit. Here's the video. Okay. 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 Hi everybody, um, I'm Julie, I'm from um, Moringa Council Libraries um, and as Mel mentioned when she was speaking, I'm here to talk to you about Your Librarian, which is our online readers advisory service. Hooray, technology success. Okay, um, so Your Librarian is a service of the library where um, we have an online form on our website Patrons can fill out about what type of read they're looking for, what kind of things they like, what they don't like. Um, the, and then it comes to me via email. Um, then I fulfil that person's request. The challenge is to get something that fills their need that we actually have in the collection. Because sometimes I think of something and I think, oh, this person wants X. I can think of a really good book that will fulfil that need, except it's not the collection. Okay, now. Um, and staff volunteered their faces for the website. As you can see, there's four of them at the bottom. Um, Mel's already spoken about this. But um, what is Readers Advisory and why do we care? Why does good Readers Advisory matter? And as professionals, why is it important that it is something that we can deliver? Um, there's nothing better than seeing a customer walk out of a library with exactly the kind of book that they want to read because you, as the information professional, took the time to listen to what they like and offer them something that makes them excited about reading. As Mel mentioned when she was speaking, it's not about what you like as the person giving the advice. Um, not to say that you can't use your knowledge that you have to help you when you do readers' advisory. If someone comes up to you and says, I'd like a crime recommendation, and you're a crime reader, and you think, well, I can think of really a lot of things that you'd like. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> what am I talking about? Yes, um, it doesn't mean you can't use your personal knowledge of what you have read to fulfil a customer's need. But conversely, if they are interested in something you don't like, it's your, not your job to judge them and say, Oh, you want to read Fifty Shades of Grey? I so don't recommend that. Come over here and pick something else. Um, this is um, the website, as I was saying. In, in the bottom corner um, is where the Your Librarian section is. I was going to try and do this live, um, but I'm not sure if 
internet connection would work, knowing my luck, probably not. So <clears throat> this is what the customer sees when they go to the your librarian form. Tell us about a few books or authors that you have liked, other titles, and we'll find other titles that you might enjoy. So tell us about some books you've liked, what did you like about them, what did you not like and why, what phrase would you use to describe your favourite book, what are you in the mood to read next, do you like fiction or non-fiction, etc, etc, etc. Um, do you have a preferred format is important. Some people only want audiobooks. Some people only want ebooks. If you're like me and you can't see, it has to be large print. Where do you get most of your reading suggestions? Um, is there anything else you'd like to tell us about your reading interests that can help us choose the right books for you? Um, I've got some very interesting answers to some of those. Um, and I wanted to share the ones that I thought were funny. Um, tell us about some books and authors you didn't like and why. And one woman said, G by John Berger, I have no idea what they were thinking in the 70s. The pictures made someone who was looking over my shoulder freak out. <laughs> okay. I'm not keen on books with dark themes of family dysfunction. I don't like violent or harrowing themes in fiction. So sometimes people are very specific about what they don't want. Like, I don't want this. I don't want that. I had a gentleman who wanted audiobooks only with a male main character, only read by a male. So sometimes it's like, wow, that's an extremely specific, narrow feel. Um, but that's what RA is about. We're trying to fulfil what they want. <clears throat> Another lady said she didn't want violent murder, blood and guts. I won't read books where the first words in the blurb mention a character's murder. That was actually quite difficult because the blurb usually says, XYZ was killed and then so-and-so investigated. Um, tell us about some books or authors you've enjoyed. I'd like political thrillers but not with too high a body count because that starts to become absurd. That was really difficult. I'm going to run out of time. Um, this is the section where we have um, librarians who work at the library put up pictures of themselves and recommended reading lists. I was going to do that, but I'm not going to. Um, we got some very good feedback. Um, thank you for providing this reading list. Can I have more suggestions? Um, thank you for the list of titles. I'm very happy with your suggestions, etc. So all the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive so far. One lady was so happy with her suggestions, she made cookies. She came in with the list and she said, this is so excellent. I've made you some cookies and they were still hot. And I was like, I'm only doing my job, that's okay, but thank you. Um, that's it for me. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And Renee, just a quick question from me. I'm assuming that when you send those lists to people, you don't automatically request them for people. They need to do that themselves. So, sorry, say again. No. 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 When you create lists for people, you don't actually request them for you. They have to request it themselves. Yes. That's okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right. Now, our last presenters before lunch. Librarians Choice. It's probably still on a USB. Oh, okay. No, it's on the oh, it's on Librarians Choice. I'm not seeing it. Is it? Oh, yes. Yes, again. The lovely Megan Mel and Mel Tolnay. Now, I did have, I may on your things have swapped their names over, so I'm just going to call them the M&Ms. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm just going to do this by myself. I know that we're going over time, so I'm going to be as quick as I can. This is a project that Megan and I are working on independently, so it's not part of our work that we do at our libraries. It's called Librarian's Choice, and we would really like to invite all of you to have a look at our website and to see what we're doing. Um, every month what we're going to do is produce a list of 10 books that were published that month by an Australian publisher that have been voted on by library staff around the country. What's exciting for us about these lists is that they're going to be diverse, featuring genres 
apart from literary fiction, it can be anything that people read and vote for. So it's going to have things like crime and romance and spec fic, anything that people like. We think that libraries across the country play a really important role in the discovery and promotion of books and authors and in recommending those books to their communities um, as a unified and highly qualified voice with all of the libraries across Australia hopefully participating in this. We think that we'll be delivering quality content on a regular and frequent basis and that the Librarian's Choice List is going to introduce new authors and titles to a wider audience. So our inspiration was from Library Reads, which I hope some of you know about. It's a site that's in America that is doing just that. They've had huge success with it. And there's also been another offshoot that's called Lone Stars, which is a really similar project that's happening up in Canada. Something that has been really interesting to us is that this isn't just promoted within the libraries, it's really been embraced by the publishers. And these are two examples of ads that publishers have produced showing that their titles have been put onto the, um, into the library reads list. So that shows us that the publishers actually think that there is real value in being involved in the project. So what they do and what we will be doing is we will be making a bunch of resources that you'll be able to use in your own library in the way that best suits your needs. So there'll be printable bookmarks, there'll be printable book lists that have got descriptions of the books, there'll be a newsletter, there will be resources that you can use to create displays in the library. This is just an example of a social media post about one of the books on the list. Again, social media. We are making up stickers so that you can put them onto the books that have been on the top 10 list for that month. And this is an example again. Um, this is a book of top 10 books from 2015. Now, that's not a voted on list. I've just made that up of the books that I thought were the top 10 Australian <laughs> books from last year. But when we actually officially launch and publish, it won't just be what I think, it'll be what everybody thinks. But we wanted to just give you a taste of what it's going to look like. So what our thoughts is, much like Read, Watch, Play actually, it's not being branded with anything except librarian's choice. So just like lots of libraries have staff picks or fast backs or rapid reads or something like that, we would hope that this will be embraced by libraries across Australia and be used within your own libraries. And because it's just called Librarian's Choice, you'll be able to have it in your library and use it as if it's work that's just been done in your library. Your community's not necessarily going to recognise that it's a nationwide thing, and I think that's fine. So what we are going to be asking people to do is to read advanced review copies of books, either and people don't have to do a review, you can just vote on the books that you think were the best. So when we're talking about why participate, and this is either as an individual or as a library service, it's about strengthening relationships with, part, with publishers and trying to advocate for ourselves to make sure they see the value of the good work that we do. Um, it's about working together across the country. It's great to come to seminars like this and see other librarians from New South Wales, but I don't think I have ever had much chance to work with other librarians from other states. So I'm really excited about that and looking forward to that. It's a great way to keep up with what's hot, even if you don't have time to read and review. There will be a list every month of 10 new books that have been voted on as being quality reads. Um, it'll enhance your readers' advisory skills and it'll also help our communities discover great reads. Um, one of the things that often comes up when we're talking about using the readers' advisory tools that are available to us is that a lot of the things like novelists don't strongly feature Australian content. Well, novelists features the library reads books, so the American version, they've got that on there. And what we will be doing is also putting a case to them to also promote our things. We can't say why they wouldn't be happy to. We'll be doing the work for free and it'll be making the resource even more useful to our local market than it already is. So, at the moment, this is a really small project. As I say, it's independent. We didn't want to do it as part of our own libraries because we wanted to be able to steer it the way that we wanted it to be and we didn't want there to be any agenda behind it. Um, so at the moment, it's Megan and I. 
we're getting ready to launch and when we do we're going to be opening up and asking for a little bit more of a steering group to share the work around and also to have a little bit more diversity of opinion about how the project should be we would really like people from other states to be involved in it we're working at the moment with NetGalley to um, endorse the project which they have told us that they're going to so we're about to have a meeting with them to work out exactly how that's going to happen so we're very excited about that now, this is a shot of our website, so it's librarianschoice.org. I would really encourage all of you to have a look at it. If you are interested in finding out more about the project as we're launching it, you can subscribe and we'll keep you up to date. We're hoping to launch at the ALIA conference in Adelaide later in the year, but we're still working out the details. So at the moment, it's certainly not a project that is up and running and ready to go, but we just wanted to give you all a little bit of a taste of what we're working on and hopefully get some people subscribing ready to be our readers. That's it, thank you. Now, Megan and I will be around at lunch, so if anybody's interested and wants to ask us, come and have a talk to us. Thank you very much, Melody. I'll be subscribing. I think that's a great thing. Thanks.